in the dark shadows, in the white cold. Fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes. The order of the Abracast. We are the brave and the bold. All the writers of scripture, regardless of their divergent cultural context, held to a common theistic worldview. Furthermore, all the scripture writers held to a common view of God. The God revealed in the earliest chapters of Genesis is the same God revealed throughout the entire Old and New Testament. He is both transcendent and eminent. He is never seen as a localized tribal deity, but as the creator of the heavens and the earth. While Abraham and the nation of Israel are called to restore his name on earth, he is from the beginning revealed as the God of all the peoples of the earth. H.B. Kuhn, professor of philosophy of religion at Asbury Theological Seminary, Seminary, traces the progressive unfolding of the dimension of God's personality and his relationship both to creation and to his people, which are found in the different names by which God reveals himself. In the Old Testament, it is an excellent encyclopedia article. According to Kuhn, God's self-revelation to his people revolves around four of the central names, El, Elohim, Adonai, and Yahweh. Most of his other names are compound names built upon these four. The name El is of the oldest. Designations for the deity in the Bible and the entire ancient world. It became the general name for God in Babylonia, Arabia, and the land of Canaan, as well as the Israel, Israel, Israelitish peoples. Kuhn comments that El connotates not only the idea of might but also the idea of transcendence. Kuhn calls Elohim the plural name for God, uh, the plural of intensity. It is used over 2,000 times in the Old Testament to refer to uh, Israel's God. It's frequently used with the article Ha Elohim, meaning the one true God, which is in itself... <laughs> um, contradictory, right? If it's a plural name for God, then how can it be the one true God? What they don't mention here is it's also uh, both male and female. It's interesting. Try not to editorialize too much. Uh, the third primary name by which God reveals himself is Adonai. It does not seem to have been in common use among the Semitic peoples. Generally, it was used mainly by the Hebrews. Uh, Kuhn then writes about God's fourth and final primary name of self-revelation, which is Yahweh. Yahweh, uh, a name unique to the Israelites. The other Semitic peoples do not seem to have known it, or at least did not use it in reference to the deity, except as contacts with the Hebrew people brought it to their attention. It was the special property of the covenant of the people. This is from the handbook for spiritual warfare. It's the section called the spiritual warfare dimension of a biblical worldview. And this is going to be a fun one. Yeah. The Abracast, a cult, history, conspiracy, and violence. Explicit content indicator. This means that I use adult language. 
I do not speak in a humorless public radio hushed monotone. I am excited and enthusiastic about the information that I present and the topics I discuss. You will hear ice rattle in my glass throughout the show. On the show, I joke about bodily functions, sex acts, religion, and politics. The topics may seem random or scattered through the back catalog. A list of show topics in chronological order is provided on the featured topic link at abercast.com. If any of these issues might trigger you, this might not be the podcast for you. And I wish you good luck finding a show more to your liking. It's that time again. The music is low. The party is over. The fire is dying down. And all the ordinary people passed out long ago. Now we are the only ones left. Hey everybody, welcome to the Abercast. I'm John, of course. Um, So this is one of those kind of episodes where I feel like we might see a sort of division. I think that because of the subject matter we're dealing with, a lot of folks might not like the episode and that's well within your right to do so. However, let me explain to you how we've come to come to find ourselves talking about uh, spiritual warfare. Um, because we've talked about wizards, we talked about, you know, demons <laughs> we talked about how Solomon used these specifically the, uh, a few of these, a few more actually than these four words of God to command demons around, you know, Adonai, Tetragrammaton, Elohim, El, Ayaha, Yahweh. Um, so since we talked about these other things, I thought that we could kind of talk about another aspect of, of this. And that is, uh, this, uh, the spiritual warrior. So this is going to get a little bit into, you know, a little bit more into like a traditional, you know, maybe not Catholic, but a traditional Christian role and, um, kind of worldview. And I did a lot in the way of editing out, uh, a lot of the stuff that might act as a trigger. The guy who wrote this book, Dr. Ed Murphy had some really nice things to say about Gnosticism (laughs) and, um, so I tried really just to get in there and hack a bunch of stuff out just to get it to focus on this idea of uh, why. Well, in this episode, it's going to be why there is a spiritual warfare aspect to our reality. Why and how sort of de- these demons or these evil spirits are encro- like encroaching on our reality and why a, a person would have to turn, you know, to God or to a Jesus or to the Adonai or Elohim to do spiritual combat. And that way, I hope that it still stays interesting uh, to some of those people out there who might not dig this kind of worldview or this kind of angle on the subject matter. However, I thought, uh, it would be a fair shake to do so. So I'm going to stop trying to explain myself now and get to it because we got a lot to get through. Um, this is the start of a new series. So if it's kind of got cold water already, then just bear with me. Keep in mind the kind of stuff that we talk about and we're actually going to dive deep. It kind of goes back to, uh, uh, before Genesis. And I know a lot of people dig, um, those episodes. So, There's that. Um, Before we get started, I just broke my fast like an hour ago. I broke my fast with a handful of peanuts and a gigantic Cobb salad. And you know what comes next? (laughs) That's right. I got the go juice. So before we get rolling, I would like to uh, raise this vessel of the art and thank our Patreon and subscribe star supporters. Thank you. Without you, none of this could be happening. And uh, in a vein, in that vein, uh, my toast this evening is going to be, here's to you, my absent friends. Thank you. All right. Um, very quickly, for those of you who are doing the fat, the de fast this month, I just got off my 42 or sorry, 48 hour preparatory next week on the 27th. 
starting at 8 p.m. The 72 hour fast starts. If you're interested, hit me up. We can talk about it. Bullshit. I'm pretty easy to find. Um, there's a lot of people that are interested, but kind of still on the fence. And then there are um, a few people that are ready to go. We're ready to go. So uh, if you're playing along at home, there's that. And okay, so like I said, the handbook for this for spiritual warfare by Dr. Ed Murphy. We're back to these names. It was in the Exodus story that God gave his name as his covenant name between himself and his people. Thus, from this time onward, the events of the Exodus formed the core of the Hebrew proclamation. I am Yahweh, your God, Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Exodus 22. Kuhn observed that God had taken the initiative in restoring the knowledge bond which existed between God and the fallen man, a bond which was fractured by the fall and was through his re uh, revelation to Israel of himself under the name Yahweh or Yehovah. That is the unfolding of the saving history became visible. The unveiling of God's nature by the giving of his name to Israel was of supreme significance to the entire biblical system. All through the Old Testament, Israel's God is declared to be the one true God, and he is the God of creation, and he is the Lord of all, and even of the nations through the latter are seen in his rebellion against him have degenerated from monotheism into polytheism and idolatry and immorality. This process, uh, Dr. Murphy says, is uh, de-evolution. It is not evolution, and these three always go together. The scriptures reveal that the gods of the nations are no gods. They are not realities in themselves. They are powerless to save their followers. In essence, they are demons who manipulate the pagan god systems and actually receive the hom the homage paid to the no gods. Thus, it is possible to speak of the biblical worldview when it comes to the person of God himself, while admitting progressive nature of God's disclosure of himself to humanity after the fall. He is the same God who established personal relationships with man before the fall. In that sense, he is uh, self discourse has never varied. Uh, he was then what he is now, and he himself affirms, I am the Lord, I do not change. Hold on, I gotta go grab my uh, new international red version. I gotta go grab my red letter, hold on. It is uh, Malachi 6. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. I mean, there is some wiggle room there, right? Obviously, the God has changed. Uh, the God of the Old Testament is almost unrecognizable. I would say totally unrecognizable to the God of the New Testament. However, as I said, I'm not. I'm trying not to get. I'm trying not to get sucked into that. I'm trying to stay with the work, you know. Spiritual warfare worldview. The biblical worldview dimension can be expressed in one statement. Present reality exists in a state of cosmic earthly conflict or spiritual warfare. In philosophical terms, modified dualism exists in the universe. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of evil supernaturalisms are engaged in a fierce conflict one against the other. Absolute dualism affirms that the ultimate reality is eternally dualistic and that good and evil have always existed and always will exist. Biblical dualism declares a modified dualism. Present reality exists in a state of dualism, but such was not so in the beginning, nor will it be so in the future. 
In the beginning, God is the view of Scripture. There was no evil, no opposing force, only God, and God is good, and God created mortal beings, the angels, and then placed them within his kingdom. Still, there was no dualism. They obeyed his will, and at some point in the hidden past, a rebellion occurred within the angelic kingdom. More on that later. Dualism was born. I mean, uh, I would say as soon as he made matter, dualism was born. But again, I'm not arguing the point. I keep saying I'm not going to argue the point of the Gnostics, but I'm not going to do it. Dualism was born. Evil entered God's kingdom, dividing it into two worlds, in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of Satan. This is the biblical view, view of the distant past. As the focus of scriptures move through time from the eternal past into the eternal future, dualism vanishes. The ultimate state is that of eternal monism. Only God and his perfect kingdom will exist in the future eternal. The very concept of eternity past and eternity future presents an apparent contradiction in our minds. Well, <laughs> it's like trying to divide by infinity. I always had, I had, this is the problem I, I had, I've always had with um, Galactus and the Silver Surfer, right? Norin Rad is trying to stick up for his, he, he's got a, a planet full of, you know, super high minded, woke kind of uh, individuals, scientists and whatnot. And Galactus shows up and he's like, yo, bitches, I'm going to eat your planet. And Norrin Rad gets up there and he makes a bargain with him. He's like, hey, I volunteer to be your herald. I will go forth into the uh, void and search out lifeless planets that you can feed off of. And so you wouldn't be a genocidal fucking planet eating God monster. So Galactus cr cradles Norrin Rad in his hands and he gives him a fraction of the power cosmic. Well, when I was a kid reading that, I'm like, what is a fraction of the power cosmic? <laughs> That's what this thing here, this uh, apparent contradiction um, that Dr. Mur uh, Murray is talking about. Can that which is eternal truly have a past and future? Such words are helpful, however, to talk of the past and of the future. Dualism, however, is in present reality. The universe exists in a state of cosmic earthly conflict or spiritual warfare. Cosmic dualism is a reality. Spiritual war warfare exists in heaven. Earthly dualism is a reality. Spiritual warfare rages on earth. Some dimensions of this warfare worldview are recognized and described in different ways by different people. Some speak of the trouble. Tr struggle between good and evil. Others talk of the battle between right and wrong or between light and darkness. Still others refer to the conflict between the positive forces which seek to preserve life and order in the universe and the negative forces which tend to disturb or even destroy life and order. And the Gnostics would say between the spiritual and the material. From a biblical perspective, however, this dualism is revealed to be an ongoing conflict waged on two fronts. God and his angelic kingdom confront Satan in his uh, demonic kingdom, while their children of God contend with the children of Satan. So this idea to me. When I read that, I was like, oh, he's talking about the new gods. Um, so Jack Kirby wrote a series of comic books and they took place on varying levels of this cosmic battle that was raging. He had the new gods, which was, you know, um, Orion and the high father versus dark side and Stefan Wolf and Desaad and all this. And then, um, then there was, a. Uh, then there was like the forever people, which were kind of like in the middle with, um, Mr. Miracle. And then at the very bottom wrong dealing with this war that's raging out there. And the implications of such was so was like Jimmy Olsen, Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that that's where dark side actually, that was his original appearance is he was fucking Jimmy Olsen bad guy. <laughs> 
It's, for, it's the it's called the Fourth World. Check it out. Jack Kirby moved from Marvel Comics to DC. In order to do so, they were like, "What do you want to do?" And he was like, "I want to do everything. Give me this whole thing to do." To understand and further equip ourselves for this cosmic, earthly struggle, we must explore the realms of theology, biblical exegesis, and the experience of the people of God. Part 2. Theological Considerations, Section 1. The Origin and Scope of Spiritual Warfare. 3. Cosmic Rebellion, The Problem of Evil. That's literally the section title. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this book is pretty in-depth, everybody. Spiritual warfare is an evil issue. Warfare in itself is evil. And if evil did not exist, there would be no warfare of any kind. Evil is the most perplexing problem ever faced by humanity. Thinking men have been facing it for millennia. Um, skipping ahead. Perhaps the most complex and profound dimension of the of spiritual warfare view of present reality has to do with the origin of that conflict. Did not originate on earth with the fall of man. The Bible is clear on that point. It did did it originate somewhere or sometime in the heavenly realm, evidently before the creation of man? This seems to be the case. The Old Testament clearly hints at a cosmic rebellion against the rule of God by frequent references to evil supernatural beings which seek to injure men and lead them away from their life of obedience to God. We cannot begin with Genesis 3 because the serpent who tempts Eve is nowhere called a supernatural being. I don't know. He's a snake that can talk and knows a great deal of things in the old. (laughs) Sorry. Um, The new Testament, however, clearly identifies him as the devil and of Satan. One point is certain, at least by the intertestamental period, when Genesis three was read and explained to Jewish listeners by Jewish teachers, the serpent was identified with Satan. Uh, the New Testament interpretation of the fall of man and that of the Jews is identical at this point. While references to Satan are not common in the Old Testament, they they are in the New. Satan is mentioned several times. Once in uh, Chronicles 14 times in Job. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I wonder if they count the tell, the retelling of Leviathan as one of those times. Maybe more than one of those times. I need to look at that, right? I need to, hold on. And one uh, in Psalm and three times in Zechariah. So what I'm talking about in Job, we actually did a, a episode on Job. And in Job... Job asks God a question and God kind of freaks out on him and starts bullying him. And he goes, who are you to question me? I am the one who fought with Leviathan. I am the one who put the hooks in Leviathan's nose. And I am the one who just, you know, destroyed Leviathan or whatever. So I wonder if they're talking about. So what that leads to is there's like, there's a story there's a prologue in Genesis somewhere where God, I think, accidentally creates Leviathan. And it was such a tough customer. He had a real hard time dealing with this mistake that he made. Uh, it's a throwback to Earth uh, sky god versus serpent uh, myths. Uh, Thor versus Midgard, Marduk versus Tiamat, this sort of thing. I've talked about it uh, kind of at, at length. It's actually one of my, this is one of my prologues to my last graphic novel, The Ages, if you're interested. Check it out. StigmataStudios.com or Abercast.com. Uh, we're going to skip ahead a little bit farther to Satan's pattern of operation. This is Satan's M.O., we need to kind of examine uh, how what how he does his uh, chicanery, his trickery. 
Satan's first recorded appearance by name is found in 1 Chronicles 21.1. The passage reveals his attempt to draw David, a man of God, into disobedience to God. It suggests a pattern of operation against humanity found through Scripture discovered throughout history and experienced by believers and unbelievers everywhere in our day. We find Satan's main strategy, his primary target and his essential purpose, deception. First, we unveil Satan's main strategy of temptation and deception. The writer uh, recounts that Satan moved David to number Israel for a typically Old Testament view of the divine side of this Satanic temptation, God, or sorry, David, like Eve before him, had no idea of the origin of the thoughts which suddenly appeared in his mind. As he reflected upon them, they seemed to be correct, logical, the thing to do. Just like when you're tempted with smoking a reefer cigarette. (laughs) While his conscience evidently disturbed him, he went ahead with his plan. What David proposed to do was wrong. It was so wrong that even Joab, his uh, military commander, who was no saint by anyone's standard, saw the wrongness in David's decision and voiced his opposition to it. It was so wrong that when God's judgment fell upon Israel, David knew it was his fault and immediately repented of his wrongdoing. I have sinned greatly, he confessed. Take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly, he said. Here we discover what we will find all through the Bible. Human sin has always has a dual source. It has a human source, one's wrong choices, but it also has a supernatural source, Satan's temptations. He plants the seed of evil throughout the imaginations into human minds and hearts, intensifying the evil already there. The scriptures speak much of deception. Uh, This guy, Vine, says the deception essentially means giving a false impression. And that's how Satan approaches people. And that is evident how he first approached his angelic peers to lead them into rebellion against God. Satan's almost always begins with deception. Thus, Paul's warning in 2 Corinthians 11.3 and his mention of Satan's schemes in 2 Corinthians 2.11. However, once Satan has established a strong foothold in a person's life, deception may no longer be so important. He will also, also often unmask himself to torment and enslave his victims further. The target? Leaders. Second, we discover his main target for deception, leaders. Put this down, okay. In the case of those who do not love our God, he moves in deception against that person in all levels of leadership. Political, military, economic, religious, educational, media, family, and other kinds of leadership become the target of his deception. Why? Because they can control the destiny of humanity. Someone has stated that if a solitary man sins, he alone may be affected. If a family man sins, his entire family is affected. If a community leader sins, the community is affected. A leader over a given structure of given society sins, the entire society is affected. And remember, Epstein did not kill himself. If a national leader sins, the entire nation is affected. If a world leader sins, the whole world is affected. Who can forget Adolf Hitler? There should be a question mark there. Dishonor is the purpose. Third, we discover the main purpose of for his deception is to dishonor God by bringing shame and even judgment upon his children. Though deceiving God's leader, David... Satan brought shame upon his uh, God's people and also indirectly caused God's righteous judgment to fall upon his own children. Thus, in this first recorded appearance of Satan by name in scripture, we discover the major features of his evil schemes against God and his people. He is a deceiver who seeks to seduce 
the leader of God's people and actions of disobedience to God. He exists to dishonor God and he injures his people. The diabology, the diabology of the rest of the scripture is but an expansion of these major features of evil supernaturalism. I fucking love that word. Supernaturalism. God bless you, Dr. Murphy. All right, we're going to chainsaw through this next part. Uh, it's belief about evil spirits and universal antiquity. And he goes on to explain that um, scholars and the like, um, people that look at ancient history, reveals belief in some form of evil supernaturalism was universal in the Old Testament world. And he boils it down to these things these items here, these key questions, at least four important questions arise as we, uh, look at the above passages, which I'm not going to get into. You can find the book super easy. If you're interested in it. One, where do these evil supernatural created cosmic beings come from? The old Testament is emphatic that these were not true gods. The old Testament is equally emphatic that God did not create evil creatures. He made, uh, what was declared good. Somehow good creatures then became bad in a cosmic rebellion that continues to have devastating effect on all of creation. Well, if God's so good, why does the shitty make turn bad? All right. Like I said, I'm not going to keep doing that. <laughs> why are there always revealed to be God's enemies, the enemies of mankind in general of God's people in particular? Three, why do they incessantly seek to resist God's purpose, corrupt his creation and defile and ensnare his people and torment, afflict and destroy mankind? Everybody knows you can't destroy mankind. Have a nice day. What is their purpose in authoring such evil? For how is it that while being God's enemies at the same time, they are ultimately subject to God's will? In other words, how is it that God uses them to defeat themselves and enhance mysterious, profound dimensions of God's sovereign purposes? The Old Testament hints that these invisible, evil, supernatural, created cosmic beings are fallen, angelic creatures. Somewhere, sometime, evidently before the creation of mankind, they were led by a mighty, angelic creature, perhaps called Lucifer, into the rebellion against the lordship of God. And when it comes to the New Testament, uh, however, these pictures are much clearer. We are not left with mere hints of cosmic rebellion. Instead, the New Testament declares that such a rebellion did occur. From the Gospels to Revelations, we confront spiritual warfare both in heaven and on earth. The New Testament opens with the world of evil supernaturalism and open confrontation with the Son of God. Uh, it is the first chapter of Mark. Jesus confronts Satan in his 40-day wilderness temptation, having won that initial and in many ways decisive battle with the enemy. Jesus launches himself into his public ministry. His synagogue ministry is interrupted by demonic resistance. Jesus quickly silences and dispatches the angry, fearful, and evil spirits. Did the same chapter before the sun had risen the next day, Jesus confronts and cast out demons late into the night and the next day after his intense nighttime deliverance activity. Jesus begins his itinerant ministry. He visits the synagogues and city after city. And Mark records that these synagogues, Jesus carried out twofold activity. He was preaching and casting out demons. Incredible. What a world of spiritual conflict. All right. I'm sorry. I'm Russian bros. I'm sorry, but I still have a lot to get through and I need to get through it all tonight. So I'm going to try to pump the brakes a little bit and recoup after this. Are you the type of person who has to close and minimize windows before the boss can see? Are there things that you've seen that you dare not mention to the normies and pink boys you see shambling down the sidewalk? Have you taken one step too many down the rabbit hole? Well, fear not! 
You are always welcome on The Whole Rabbit, where we discuss things like chaos magic, Alistair Crowley, and the tarot. But that's not all. We decode the mysterious Illuminati symbolism in films like Midsummer, Joker, Doctor Sleep, and Eyes Wide Shut. On The Whole Rabbit, we even discuss occult manuals like the Kabbalion and Abram Ellen the Mage. Here is wherever you most enjoy listening to podcasts, like Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and pretty much everywhere else podcasts are available. So tune in to The Whole Rabbit every week, and join the conversation. And remember, eat carrots, shoot lasers. So this month on the Fulgar Correspondentia, just a fancy word for the mailing list, <laughs> um, since we're heading into the fourth quarter of our Genesis series, there's a little uh, brief Genesis timeline, according to me, um, that's, that's up there. Uh, also, since we are going to be getting into Jacob and Esau, I finally sat down and s- started to work on a map of the wrong son, the wrong son, the wrong blessing idea that we've been running into uh, pretty much this whole Genesis thing um, sat down and it worked out some pretty cool details. So I think it's pretty cool. Also, as always, you can look at my latest up to date uh, version of the tarot cards that I'm designing all that. If you sign, if you just sign into the mailing list, all that bonus stuff, but uh, the fellow craft episode on the Patreon and subscribe star this month, um, we're starting to look at and dissect the work of Milton William Cooper in uh, episode entitled the UFO conspiracy part one. Learn more at abracast.com. Get bonus content by signing up for the mailing list. Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. We're going to move into this next bit called Levels of Authority in Satan's Kingdom. And I'm going to try to slow it back down so it's not so frantic. I know I got sped up. I just start looking at the amount of time I had left and start freaking out a little bit. As the story of, I love this, the story of evil supernaturalism unfolds in the New Testament, we discover that there are different ranks of authority in Satan's kingdom. Furthermore, demons... Uh, evil spirits and fallen angels seem to fall into at least four different uh, classifications, not three as often affirmed. First, there are those who are free to carry out Satan's evil purposes. They inhabit the heavenlies, but also are free to operate on earth. These uh, demon spirits afflict and even indwell in the bodies of men. Second, There are rebellious angels who seem to be bound uh, in the abyss or pit. This will evidently be released in the future date as will wreak havoc on earth. Satan uh, and all free demons will be bound in this same pit during the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. This one I thought was very interesting. Third, there seems to be another group of fallen angels, which evidently became so wicked or were so guilty of evil, so horrendous that they were not permitted to exist in the heavenlies or on earth. They are bound forever, not in the abyss, uh, but in hell. The Greek word is Tartarus, incorrectly translated as hell. Vine says that Tartarus is neither Sheol, which is a name for hell, or Hades, which is a name for hell, or hell. But the place where these angels are, uh, whose special sin is referred to in the passage uh, are confined to be reserved into judgment. The region is described as the pit of darkness. This, the first time that I was reading this, I was thinking about the story of the watcher angels who, you know, 
Earth Chicks Man. You know what I'm talking about. They came down. They had the Nephilim. Anyhow, they were uh, 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 bound under Mount Hermon. Perhaps this is the group of fallen angels that um, this is talking about. Uh, these spirits will uh, inevitably, will they will never be released. They seem to be held in darkness until the day of their judgment. And finally, there's this fourth group of evil angels who seem somehow to be bound within the earth. We see this in uh, the salt. We see all these in Solomon, I bet. I think maybe except for the, the watcher angel stuff. Um, we are able to take the words literally. Four of them are mentioned as being bound to the river Euphrates. When they release, they will lead a demonic army of destruction against mankind. That's Revelations 9, 13 to 21. All right, so we're going to look at uh, the next bit is uh, cosmic conflict facts from the future. This is all about Revelation 12. Uh, Revelation 12 speaks of a future day where there will be a final cosmic conflict between the angels of God under Michael and the angels of Satan. Even if one does not hold to a futuristic view of Revelations, this passage still reveals several undeniable facts. Okay? Undeniable facts. <laughs> I just want to Underline that <laughs> one Satan rules over a kingdom of evil angels. This kingdom of evil supernaturalism opposes God and his kingdom. The kingdom of evil is defeated by the archangel Michael, who evidently serves as the commander of God's holy angels and his angelic army. Can I get an amen? Satan and his angels will be or already have been dethroned from their place of prominence in heaven. Satan and his angels will be, or already have been, cast down to earth to bring woe to mankind. You can't bring woe to mankind. Have a nice day. The kingdom of evil supernaturalism is a kingdom of intense hatred against the people of God, and they make war against those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of a Jesus. Because the activity of these wicked angels is identical with that of evil spirits and demons found in scripture, they must represent the same evil creatures. Even with this brief overview, one thing is certain. The New Testament clearly declares that sometime, somewhere, cosmic rebellion occurred in a vast army of angels evidently exercised their free will and chose to resist their God and creator. The army of fallen angels has one master over them, and he is called the great dragon, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Their purpose is to deceive the whole world and war against the children of God. Sin, therefore, first originated with Satan, the evil one. He next evidently deceived some of the angels into following him in rebellion against God. Together they form the cosmic kingdom of evil. One group of these fallen angels seem to constitute the demons, those evil unclean spirits who afflict mankind and oppose the church of the living God. It is primarily against them that the church's warfare is declared. Rebellion in the heavenlies and on earth. How is it possible for sin to arise in a kingdom of complete sinlessness? Hmm. That is the kingdom of God. How could sinless angels sin? The scripture nowhere attempts to explain how or why Satan and the angels were created with the capacity for sin. Nor do they explain how or why human beings were created with the same capabilities. So he goes on here at length, marveling at the fact that the Bible records, but doesn't explain two things. Uh, no attempt was made to explain the existence of God and no explanation either of the time or manner of original creation is revealed. So take that as you may, but Dr. Murphy continues. I share uh, it in common with biblical commentators. God is the only non-creature in the universe. As eternal God, he is without being and without end. 
He exists, but he was not created. He is here, but he never began, and he was, is, and shall be. Thus, he and he alone is absolutely perfect. He has a perfect mind, and he knows everything about everything, and he has perfect emotions, and he feels is always what should be felt, and has perfect will, and he chooses what is right indeed by the very definition as perfect God. He cannot choose evil. He cannot sin. All creatures are imperfect, however, by the definition of God cannot create God. Uh, he can create only beings which are less than God and therefore imperfect. The creation can never be equal to the creator. By the very act of creating creatures in his own image and likeness, God is creating creatures with mind, emotion, and a will similar to his own. Well, I see some pretty big problems with this statement. I'm going to blow through it. But, um, I mean, he just got done telling us that God can't sin. Literally, the last fucking paragraph. He cannot choose evil. <laughs> Is that saying that God doesn't have free will? I don't know. Mm, it seems like maybe that's that might be an unexpected consequence of what he's saying. By definition, he cannot create creatures in his own image and his own likeness, which are not free to think, feel, and choose for themselves. Furthermore, creatures cannot be created in God's image and likeness, and at the same time be pre-programmed only to do God's will. I'm skipping ahead here. I'm only skipping ahead because I'm getting off track with all this, and it's just going to drive me farther and farther away from the, the point. <laughs> Uh, we've talked at length about my, uh, what I feel God is and what the angels are to, to him. I mean, uh, holy, holy, holy. All right. Cos the cosmic rebellion becomes earthly. Now we're getting into it. <laughs> just now are we getting into it? No, we're just setting the stage. Okay. So now we're getting into it the earthly realm of spiritual warfare with the introduction of humanity into the conflict between these two kingdoms, the formerly exclusive cosmic rebellion now becomes a cosmic earthly rebellion. The historical pictorial account given in Genesis three, one through 24, the historicity of the fall is confirmed in scripture, such as second Corinthians and revelations. The historic fact of the fall is also used by Paul in Romans five, first Corinthians 15 in connection with the historical uh, redemptive action of a Jesus as the last Adam as the second man, I call Genesis three, a pictorial account because of the vivid symbolism it uses to describe the historical events. The main truth is the story is just as real as the historic. If one admits the symbolism as they are, if one follows the strict literalism, three lessons from Genesis three, I consider Genesis three to be the most important passage on spiritual warfare in the entire old Testament. And we will deal with it in detail later. I don't know if we're going to deal with it in detail later. This might be good enough. Three of the main lessons to be learned from this story contribute to the discussion at this point. Humanity was led into rebellion against the rule of God by an already existing evil supernatural being. He out too. He outwits the sinless but inexperienced woman. Three, being a former sinless creature himself, the certain the serpent, Satan, is aware when her thinking has become disordered. It closes out this section here saying, You will surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And was that uh, all that was needed? The deception is complete. Eve's mind embraces Satan's thoughts. She now sees the forbidden tree from an entirely new and wrong perspective. The origin of the evil Satan. We still face a difficult question, however. While the fallen angels and humanity were deceived by Lucifer. They're using the name Lucifer because it's specifically before his fall. 
Who deceived Lucifer? The biblical answer is clear, even though it could occur nowhere explained. Satan is the father of lies because he himself is a liar. Jesus affirms he lied both to angels and to humanity because he was already a liar. Furthermore, Jesus declares that he was a murderer from the beginning. What does this mean? According to Leon Morris, the term rendered beginning can also denote an origin in the same sense of basic cause. First cause applying the truth to John eight forty four gives us an important insight. Jesus is affirming that the murderer has its origins in Satan. He is its first cause. Jesus next connects that origin with Satan's nature as the liar and the father of lies. Morris connects that this murderer with this murder with the human race. It was through Satan that Adam became mortal. Romans five twelve. Satan thus became the murderer of the whole human race. He was a man killer. We can take this truth one step further back to the true origin of murder through lying. He evidently did so when he deceived a host of God's angels into rebellion against God, thus bringing about their death. That is the eternal separation of God. We're going to skip down to part six. The cosmic earthly warfare begins. Genesis three, a major focus on spiritual warfare experienced by humanity begins with G uh, Genesis three. I will make no attempt to deal in any depth with the critical issues often raised about the story. As mentioned previously, Genesis three is both an historical and pictorial account of the fall of humanity. It actually happened the way it is, quote, recorded, unquote. The quotes were mine, not Dr. Murphy's. There really uh, was a historical Adam and Eve. Not only were they the first human beings created in the image of God, but they stand as the representatives to the entire human race. Their transgression, particularly that from Adam as the head of the human race, is seen in Scripture as the fall of the human race. Romans 5, Corinthians 15, mysteries in the Genesis 3 account have um, disturbed the minds of biblical scholars, both Jewish and Christian for centuries, the prince of Bible commentators, John Calvin, writes that the story raises many an arduous question. Moses, the writer of Genesis, began his account with another given the talking, the seducing serpent, and how the serpent was more cunning than any beast in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, had has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. Genesis 3. Well, I know this is something a little bit different, but I hope you guys, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. As this is just the beginning um, of this series. I know, like I said, it is a little bit different, but I hope, I hope you guys still got it. I hope you liked it. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you to all the supporters. Hey, also I got some good, uh, iTunes ratings and reviews lately. I try not to check it because it enrages me because <laughs> you motherfuckers, but I got some good ones. So thank you for, uh, those of you, uh, shoes, booze, and tattoos specifically. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. Bye everybody. I'm sorry. This ran so long. I had so much sh shit to talk about. Okay, here we go. Thank you for listening to this episode. Send an email or visit us on social media to let us know what you think about this topic. And please remember to leave a five-star rate and review. Hey, did you learn something? Did you laugh? Supporting me is a way for you to be a part of the Abercast and ensure its growth and sustainability. 
It also means I can create a normal schedule for shows and bonus shows, as well as the exclusive Fellow Craft episodes. By supporting the show, you are not only a listener, but you are a part of the show. You supporting the show gives me a way to offer fun rewards as a thank you for showing your appreciation and support for our projects. Do you have an idea for a reward that you don't see? Let me know. My supporters are my partners. I currently pay for you to listen to the Abercast. Not only do I pay the hosting bills out of my own pocket, I volunteer my time and uh, talent to each and every episode of the Abercast. The price of books, the time and resources of reading and researching, the massive amounts of gin and tonic needed, the equipment it takes to record the shows, the time and resources it takes to create the bonus material, and the cost to maintain the internet presence. Is it worth your support? I don't know. I am proud of the Abercast, and I feel like I'm improving all the time. In addition uh, to creating the show that you dig... And that you are excited about, I also have a full-time commitment and other obligations. So why financial support? All of the supporters help me focus my time in, on the quality and development of the podcast. And what if you can't afford, you know, $1 or $3 or $10 or whatever a month? Believe me, I get that. There are many degrees of support, but if you can't support the show financially, please consider leaving a five-star rate and review on your preferred podcast app. And don't forget that you could sign into the mailing list and still unlock a lot of bonus content. Thank you. I cannot put into words how much it means to me that you listen to the show each time I post a new episode. Your feedback support and love of the stories that we talk about here is what keeps me going. 